Yeah. Every show. And this is another episode of UFO Garage. I'm Ben. And I'm Joe, and this is where we talk about UFOs, aliens, and all things weird. Yeah, dude. What's up, man? What's up, bro? So we got a little change of scenery here today. Yeah. Uh, we're at my house, in my kitchen, <laughs> yeah. with uh, Mr. Jim Goodall. Hey, came how's it going? To, came by to visit us all uh on his on his long road trip and i'm excited to hear some stories about it man uh i'm so glad that you were able to actually make it out here and uh say hi to us i promised you when i when i met you in in san francisco in january that i was gonna go on a road trip and i was gonna i was gonna make sure i went through texas there's a lot of people i want to see yeah and i i was just it was it was a, a I was just drawn to it, the two of you guys. You were there in the lobby, and it was, you just, it was, you just, you were very happy, go lucky, having a good time drinking your wine. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I felt comfortable. I said, I'd like these guys. And oh, yeah. I didn't know what, I, I knew I was going to come through Texas sometime uh-huh. this year. And the, and the first trip got canceled because I was in Minneapolis when uh, George Floyd uh, came to an end. Yeah, and they burn up that part of Minneapolis, and my son had to drive through that area every day. Oh, that's gotta Damn. be rough. Yeah, really? yeah, that's not fun. No, Damn. no, but he drives a big truck, mm. and he says, "You get in my way? Oh, 800 horsepower, whatever it is in there, he's <laughs> gonna go right through." <laughs> yeah. Yes, man. No, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm just thrilled. And thank you for your hospitality and dinner and uh, your friendship yeah. no problem yeah. man no problem Hell thank yeah, you man. uh for the book guys check this out jim um for those of you who don't know uh he's an author this is just one of many of 27, his books 27 my, my 20th set my 27th book is at the publisher's and it'll be out in february in february and that's the uh and that one's called the, the Se- 75 years of the Lockheed skunk works Awesome, awesome. Yes. That's going to be a great one. This one I'm holding is the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird, the illustrated history of America's legendary March Mach three Mach three spy plane by Jim Goodall. That's awesome. Yeah. And Jim also brought us this pretty sweet patch that he designed. It's the uh, the Groom Dry Lake Dreamland Area 51 patch. Uh, that's a that's kind of a, an interesting story. Uh, you want to you want to go into how this kind of became a, a funny thing. Well, I mean, <laughs> we, did, we did the article in Popular Science, March of 64, not 64, 94, excuse me. And it's, it was the best-selling and, and the most read article uh, issue ever. We figured six million people read, you know, you read the article and saw it. Yeah. But prior to that, there's a group of us called the Interceptors. Uh, I've been going out in the desert area, near Area 51 since the late 80s. I was the first civilian to photograph the F-117 at the fence line at Tonopah Test Range. Mm. Um, John Lear and I were on the top of Whitesides Mountain when we got buzzed by a pave hawk. And then uh, uh, I'm also one of the reasons myself and a gentleman named Glenn Campbell was not the singer, but... Uh, <laughs> Computer guy, There's a different glim camera, right? Right. <laughs> um, that it, you know, he, we are the reason why Freedom Ridge was taken away by the during the uh, the Clinton administration. So I've been going out in the desert, snooping on snooping on our government. It's my tax money, right? I want to yeah. know where it's going, what it's being spent on, and my man, my feeling has always been: if I ask my government a question, it's we the people. Yeah, you should yeah. get an answer. It's we the people. If it's classified, you tell me it's classified, I can't comment. I understand that. Right. But don't feed me a line of garbage that was because of national security. No, you don't want it you don't want it to be made public because you may be embarrassed because you spent X number of billions and billions of dollars for something that didn't work. Right. Yeah. You yeah. kept hiding the fact and altering the paperwork. <laughs> And not one admiral or general went to, went to jail. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, that would that would be a reason to definitely want to cover some stuff up for sure. I mean, I've I've gone round I've gone round and round. I went round and <laughs> round. Uh, you know, during uh, I was activated to on, for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I was on I was on for a hundred. I think it was 121 days. And I got to the Pentagon. I have a, I had a top secret clearance, which I had for 27 years. Yeah. 
I had five years active, a 10-year break, and then 21 years with the Minnesota Air Guard. And I was a historian mm-hmm. in my last 16 years. And I had to have the same clearance as the wing commander. And when I worked for the adjutant general, I had to have his clearance because I had to have access to what he did and as, as far as documentation and determine what goes into the quarterly uh, the quarterly history of the unit right. or the organization. So I had a you know, real, 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 real high clearance. That's and cool. Yeah. And I get there, and I go to get my, my permanent Pentagon pass, and there's a red flag on my, on, my, on my clearance. I'm under investigation. Oh, <laughs> God. So I go up to Garbio, and, and the lady in charge of Garbio, I said, what happened? I said... So I don't know. I said, you know, you've been under investigation for a while. Sorry. <laughs> I have to fix your mic, Jim. Uh, <laughs> it's going down. And it keeps, oh, sorry, it, it keeps. Yeah, we gotta tighten it. Oh, real tight. Boom. All right. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I yeah. keep seeing it like slowly. Low. Yeah, and I, and I was trying to hold it up a little bit. <laughs> I know you're doing go, good. And I didn't want to be. Yeah. So, uh, here, here I have a flag in my clearance. Which means I have to go through the I have to go through metal detector and other protocols. You don't have to do it if you have yeah. an official yeah. badge. And it's just, and it just irritated the hell out of me. So it remind me. So and for people that don't know uh, why you'd have this clearance, what projects? I mean, as much as you can say. Oh no, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing I can't say. Yeah. Uh, uh, during my time in the, in the Minnesota Air Guard, uh, I always wanted to be a historian, and I ended up being a writer. My, my 27th book is the publisher, and it's always been about airplanes or things that go bump in the night and you know spooky stuff. So I've always done that, and, it, and it's just something that I, I wanted to do. So I, I had a special relationship with the, uh, with the, with the, the then adjutant general and also the chief of staff for air is General Wayne Gatlin, and my uh, the, the AG was uh, uh, Gene uh, Gene Andriotti, super guy. Now I get I get emails from him all the time. I get emails from all most of the generals I I dealt with in the, in the Minnesota Guard. That's cool, and I loved it. So I always had access to you know to everything that they had access to. Yeah, and it was uh, so I went when I. Uh, Went to, to uh, Desert Storm. It was uh, Desert Shield. It was just a, it was an incredibly interesting time, and the thing I was looking for because I'm an airplane nut, mm-hmm. and when I was I can't remember how old I was. Uh, my dad gave me a book. It was before I got married, so it had to be before '71, and it was um, oh, Eric von Don. Donegan, whatever it is. Yeah, oh, Chariots yeah. of the Gods. Chariots of the Gods. And I read, I read all, th- I think he had three volumes, the three versions. I read all three, and I just, oh, I like this. This is, this, this intrigues this me. Is interesting, yeah. yeah. So um, I've, I've always had an interest in that. And I, I'm the type of guy who's, I'm always looking up in the sky. Right. And, and, I'm, and I've, and I've, I've been out the middle of Tipico Valley, which is east of Area 51. Mm-hmm. No moon. It's so dark, I can't see my feet. Yeah. My eyes haven't adjusted yet. And I'm thinking, here, okay, if you can read my mind, read my mind, abduct me. But let me bring my camera. <laughs> abduct me. Oh, <laughs> they haven't done it yet. But <laughs> to my knowledge. I mean, right, I, right? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, don't until, know. yeah that you uh, know of. I do know that people were in my head for nine hours here about 35 years ago. Uh, Whoa. Uh, so maybe they planted something in there. I don't know. Oh, yeah. maybe. Oh, maybe. The sur- yeah. Sur- yeah, surgery. Yeah. 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 So Who you know, knows? It's, just, it's just, it's something that I just, I've had, I've had a passion for. And be- because of, I don't take no for an answer. Oh, <laughs> I, my my mind my mind's in about twelve different places. Yeah, I kind of simultaneously. Kinda, kinda you're all right. <laughs> I um, when I when I found out my my pass was my I couldn't get my permanent pass. I went to uh, I won't say her name. I don't. She's she's probably not alive. It's been so long since Desert Shield. And I uh, so I called up uh, Pete Ames. Pete was the deputy director for program security for special projects. Anything spooky. He would know. Oh. And I called him up. I didn't know where I was. I said, Pete, this is Jim Goodall. Oh, Jim, how's it going? I said, you're screwing with my clearance. Oh, no, I would never do that. I said, 
No one else in Garbio did it. It could only come from you. Yeah. I said, Were you, are, are you located in the Pentagon? He said, yes. I said, well, I'm up at Guard Bureau here on third floor. Um, uh, I, am, I need to sit down with you. We need to talk. And he said, okay, uh, I'll meet you at 1515 at, uh, 15, uh, in my office, 5D 156. Now, they've changed all the numbers in the Pentagon. But this, yeah. you go down this long hallways in the D ring, there's nothing here but one door in the middle of this long, long hallway. It's 5D 156, and I, I press just the buzzer, <laughs> and the vault door opens. I go in, and I, I'm in uniform. I'm a tech sergeant at the time. Yeah. And I said, uh, I'm Jim Goodall. I'm here to see Pete Ames. And the, <laughs> the uh, I, think, I think it was, a, it was a young tech sergeant, female. She about fell off the floor. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I, had a, I, got, a, I got there at one, right at 1 o'clock, so I had 15 minutes to wait. I had a parade of people coming through and saying, hey, you, Jim Goodall, Goodall, you want to see what it looks like? In per, come, I mean, it was like, <laughs> I, I just, I was, it, so finally Pete calls me, and Pete was kind of a short guy. Uh-huh. And I, not, I'm not intimidated. Um, I, was, I was supposed to die in 1986, and I didn't. And I don't give a, I don't give a garbage uh, about a lot of things. Yeah. And you're not going to intimidate me. And he's telling me, he said, well, I don't like the questions you're asking. And I said, Pete, I'm an American taxpayer, and I can ask anything of my government. And if it's not classified, I demand the truth, and I demand an answer. Yeah. Yep. So these are my airplanes. I said, Pete, you don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, these are, these are owned by the American taxpayer. You're the custodian. Yep. And if it's, and it's your job to maintain their airworthiness and more fighting capability, and if it's a classified program, to maintain the classification. It's not your job to feed me a line of crap when I ask a legitimate question. I said, I said cuz he was holding my book, my beat my F1 I forget to mention my F117 book yeah. had just come out. That was my first book. Yeah. And that's the boomerang crazy the one, the one that looks like looks like an air, arrowhead. The yeah, yeah. okay. The, it was the, the fighter. It was the one that dropped the bombs in Baghdad during Desert Storm. Right, Storms. right, yeah. The black, they called it the black jet. Okay. And um, that book had come out. I had sent Ben Rich who was the president of the Lockheed Skunk Works at the time. He, he told me, he said, Jim, he says, it's still classified. I can't comment. Mm. I said, okay. I sent it to Pete Ames, his office, for clearance. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to do it, but as a member of the Guard and someone with a top secret clearance, I felt I had to. And I sent it to DOD. Well, no, we did anything. This is six weeks before I sent it to my publisher. Yeah. So Peter's giving me all this crap. He says, in your book, and he's holding, he's, you know, he's talking about my book, and he's, you know, he's just... Says in your book, says you had stuff that was classified. I said, Pete, said, you know, you know why I was successful in putting this book together as fast as I did and the thrill that I did? In 1968, when I asked for photographs of the Blackbird that were unclassified then, and they were never classified to begin with, I wanted external views of a couple different Blackbirds. And your official policy was not to cooperate. So because you didn't cooperate, I started digging. Oh, and, man. And the more I dug, the, you know, the deeper I dug, the more I found out, the more I found out, the deeper I dug. Yeah. Then that result is this Blackbird book. It's the most complete pictorial history of the history and development of the Lockheed Blackbirds. So, okay, I have a question. So you're saying the, the more you got kind of like told, no, you're not allowed to know this stuff, the more you dug. Is this when this you started sneaking on to Area 51 and no, 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 Link area? Started, is that a totally different story? I, no, <laughs> no, I've been I've been to the fence line at Tonopah Test Range in Area 51 about 80 times yeah. wow. over the last 30 years. Wow. Right. I know where to go, what we're not to do. I know yeah. I'm not intimidated by little red dots on my chest. I'll yeah. get into that later. <laughs> 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 um, no, I just, I just, I just, like I say, I'm not easily intimidated. Yeah. I had a brain tumor, and they took it out on January 28th, 1986. That's the day Challenger blew up. And I was under anesthesia for 11 hours, and, the, wow. and the, the surgery was nine and a half. And I wasn't supposed to survive. Wow. And I'm here today. And once you come to terms with dying, it took me 36 hours. From wow. the time I, I had a brain tumor 
six hours, 50 50 chance of survival. Any hour, every, every hour after that, it drops, and he goes, it drops dramatically, it goes, yeah. points straight down. And I said, and if you, sub- if, if you survive surgery, you have a 70% chance of facial paralysis, blindness, and seizures. Yippee. Ugh. So it hit me 36 hours later, and I was a puddle. I was at my favorite pub, dancing to my favorite band. I went dancing there. I went dancing almost every night from 8.30 to 9.15. Yeah. That was my R&R time. And the kids were already to bed. I went dancing, and I come home. I didn't, wasn't there to pick up anybody, but it, the band has just gone on break at 9.15. I'm getting ready to go home, and all of a sudden it hits me. I'm 40 years old, and I'm going to die. It took me three hours to drive four miles. I was a puddle. Man. I got home. Uh, my wife, who I'm still very close to today, uh, we've been just divorced 30 years. We only married 20. But uh, she was really, really good. And I was just, I, my, I'm not going to see my, my son uh, graduate from high school. I'm not going to see my daughter grow up. I had a little, my son was 10. My daughter was 2. And I was just, it was, I was terrible. Yeah. And then at 3 o'clock in the morning, almost as the second hand went up, it was like someone changed channels. <clears throat> and I got a peace just come over me. And I felt, you know, if this is the end, I have no regrets. None. Yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of stupid things. <laughs> and if I live, I'll do a lot of stupid more. <laughs> And I did a lot of stupid things, thank God, before the internet. <laughs> you, never, you never stole a train, though. Yeah. You never did that. I don't know what the statute of limitations is on that. So, <laughs> yeah, that's an inside secret if anybody didn't know. Um, no, I, just, I, have, I have a real positive out, outlook on life. Yeah. And I don't have a lot of friends, but I'm attracted to certain people. And when I, so I met you two guys in, in San Francisco, there was there was... Almost an electric energy yeah, that I, sort of drew me towards towards Jalen because there was a lot of people. There was a lot of people yeah. there, and there was a lot of interesting people. Yeah. I feel the same, man. Yeah, <clears throat> Joe was like, "Dude, that's Jim Goodall." I was like, "Ah, it sounds familiar," but and then he had to explain. And I mean, I I knew of you. I mean, my, my own yeah. my only really really claim to fame besides a guy who knows an awful lot about Area Fifty One is I knew Bob Lazar before he went to work out at S Four. Yeah, and I bet Bob, Bob Lazar, very... Bob Lazar, and our and I are friends today. Yeah, and you went to visit him after uh, after uh, San Francisco, right? Like, wasn't it after the conference you went to? Well, to... I, I was going, I was going to, but uh, that's where the beginning of this COVID. Oh, okay, you know, got this, it. You know, got this, it. You know, it's a kung fu flu. The, <laughs> the, the kung flu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. And, yeah uh, so, so. Yeah. Uh, so you knew you knew Bob Lazar before the story came out, before all that. I mean, you knew I knew friends Bob with, Lazar. Still friends with John. I Lee. knew Bob Bob Lazar before he was hired to work out in the desert. Yeah, so, he just he had just moved to Las Vegas from from Albuquerque. It was the day that I had photographed my first F F one seventeen. Yeah, stealth fighter at the fence line at Tonopah. It's John Lear and myself. And I was shooting print film because I wanted I wanted to get the images right away. I normally sh- shot Kodachrome, and this was before digital cameras. Mm-hmm. And the digital cameras they had, you had a, ca- a pack about the size of a suitcase, <laughs> and it held one megabyte. Yeah, the, 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 the big there's a big floppy <laughs> yeah. disk we were talking yeah. about earlier. <laughs> and uh, uh, oh my God, I just lost track. <laughs> sorry, sorry, dude. Hey, I'm on. I'm on the, the tail end of a four thousand mile road trip, and, yeah. and we've been chatting all day. Yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> we, and, uh, we, we, yeah. No, we've, uh, we've had an awesome so day so have, far. So when I met Bob, I had I had been with John Lear. We had, I had just photographed the F one seventeen and seen the F one seventeen with a T thirty eight next to it. It was like I was twelve years old or eleven years old and seeing my first naked woman. <laughs> I mean, my my camera's shaking and out of 36 exposures i think there were only three that didn't have a little bit of blur to them oh man wow but and this this plane had never been seen by the public nope. or anyone nope so did you have an idea that nope. there would be some kind of test flight of a secret top, se- no, top I, secret no i knew i the only reason i knew the f-117 was flying john lear were heading up us 75 us 95 near scotty's junction it's sort of halfway between 
uh, Las Vegas and uh, I think Beattie or maybe Goldfield. It's almost a tone upon. Hmm. But an F-117 flew over us at about 1,500 feet. We about drove off the road. <sighs> yeah, that's pretty damn I could low. See, see this thing from, from, the, you know, from the rear end. So uh, we go into Tonopah, we have lunch, and then we drive down the road to TTR. It's a big sign. It's a B-43 nuclear bomb with a Nike Ajax booster on the end of it. It's a Sandia Labs Tonopah test range. So Whoa, that's that was cool. the right place. Damn. So we head down there, and we get, we get down to the, uh, the main gate and where the uh, passing ID is. But there's a, there's a dirt road going along the fence line. So the fence line's in, in public lands. So we drive two miles down this road. I'm out there with my camera. And I had a Tommy had a, a, a Pentex, I think it was. It's before I got Nikon, before I needed glasses. You know, so I need some <laughs> autofocus. And this, this bird come, came in with a you T-38 know, right next to it, and my heart was pounding. It's like getting laid for the first time. I didn't know what to do. I mean, yeah. I, I, was, you know, I just knew I was going to open up my camera. Be, you know, I was so excited, and I forgot to roll the thing up. And, but so, Lear and I, we head back to Vegas. Now, we're, we're 150 miles away, almost 200 miles away. And we drive, we drive uh, through Warm Springs and then down 375, the, the extraterrestrial highway. Yeah. And we always, stop, we always stopped at a little lately, and uh, Joe Travis was still alive at the time. And I've known Pat forever. Uh, I think Connie was still a baby. And uh, we had something to eat. And by the time we got back to Vegas, the photo mats were all closed. Now, those who are old enough, who have parents that are old enough... <laughs> A photo mat is where the your baristas are today. If you had print, if you needed one of your film developed, you would you would go buy a photo mat and you would drop it off. There's, it was always manned, usually one person. Mm-hmm. You pick up the phone, the, the drop off the film that day, and the next day, as long as you get in by five o'clock, the next day, all, everybody will have their uh, their uh, envel- their film processed and printed. Yeah. So the photo mats are all closed, and, and as we're heading back to Lear's place, he lived, uh, lived near South Mountain, near Nellis. Uh, he said, well, the, all the places are going to be closed. We got home about 9.15. He said, but I got a friend coming over, a, new, a guy new to, new to Vegas, uh, just moved here from Albuquerque. I think you'll find him interesting. <laughs> He's a nuclear physicist. So about 10 minutes later, doorbell rings. We go up there. This nice guy comes in into John's. Uh, study now. John's study was, I think, twenty by thirty, and every every <laughs> square inch of wall space was filled with photos signed by all sorts of famous people. That's cool. Nice. Yeah, and he held. He still holds fifteen FAI world records for flying around the world on his sixteenth birthday in his dad's Lear uh, twenty three. Really? What? Yeah, that's, awesome. that's interesting. I didn't so, know that. That's cool. So, John Lear introduced me to his new friend. He said, hi, my name is Bob Lazar. I said, nice to meet you. He said, and I told him about my dilemma having the print film. Not, and he developed the, you know, the next day. And he said, I live on the west side of town. I have a C41 processor at home. It's right over. I'll run to my house. I'll, I'll process the film. I'll make, you know, print you know, you print it up, see what you got. I said, sure, let's go. He just has it in his house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we jump, in, we jump in his car, and we're not five minutes from Lear's place. Now, Lear's house is 10,000 square feet. He, he's since sold it, but uh, he used to live out in the middle of nowhere. Now it's, it was all developed all around him. Mm. But we're heading, we're heading towards uh, West Charleston, where uh, Bob lives. He looks at me, and he said, you know, I feel sorry for Lear. I said, what do you mean you feel sorry for Lear? I said, he's from this world-famous aviation family. His dad brought the Lear jet to the world, not counting every, all the other avionics and stuff right. he developed. And he says, and a son of a bitch believes in UFOs. <laughs> How stupid is that? He says, I'm a nuclear physicist. If I can't prove it mathematically or put my hands on it, it doesn't exist. And you can't maybe, you know, I wouldn't believe a UFO if you put a gun to my head. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Bob Lazar is telling you this on the way. On the way to, to his house to print the film. <laughs> yeah. Now, when I went in there, I, 
I remember seeing a diploma. I don't, it's supposedly from MIT, mm-hmm. but I don't know. You go into someone's house for the first time, I know you have stuff on the wall. <clears throat> But 10 years later, yeah. Yeah. do you remember what it is? Or yeah. 30 years later, no, I have a really good memory, but no, I don't. Um, he has a supercomputer. Um, he had a, I mean, he had a, an email enclosure uh, you know, filled with processors and the whole bit. Whoa. Sweet. That's what, back in the day, where like a computer like that filled a whole room, right? Oh, yeah. yeah no, this, this was as big as a refrigerator. Oh, okay. Ooh, so, no, size not as fridge. Yeah. That, was, that, was, his, that was his desktop. Cool. Wow. And, uh, dang. And he was, you know, he hadn't, he hadn't got out in the desert yet. But he, he said when he lived in Albuquerque, he had a jet car with a uh, Lamborghini uh, body on it. 300 miles an hour and a quarter mile. Yeah. And it's, it's still it's in his driveway in his carport. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like dirt, like so, a turbine engine, jet engine. It was a, it was, it was a, uh, so it was a, a 50s vintage uh, jet. I mean, yeah. you, you put it, you put it, uh, you know, today's uh, engine out of the F, you know, F 22 or the F 35 and you're the, uh, the F 135 engine. With forty thousand pounds of thrust, oh my God, you, you just when it's going to suck your skin off, it's in front of it, and if you yeah. back it, you're going to fry. Um, so, uh, so you know, he, everything about Lazar when I met him <clears throat> showed me because my dad's a genius. Yeah, my dad had an IQ but about above one hundred and seventy, one hundred and eighty. Uh, he felt he couldn't learn Cantonese in two weeks, so he dropped the course. Wow. I mean, to master it. He could speak it. He mm-hmm. just couldn't master it. And he spoke seven other languages. Wow. And, Whoa. and he was triple major at uh, Caltech. So, um, He's got credentials. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, I know a genius when I'm around one. And Bob is truly a genius. And next thing I know, a year later, there's a silhouette of a guy named, I think it was Jared, talking to George Knapp, who I've been a friend with forever also, yeah. talking about reverse engineering alien spacecraft at a place called S4. <laughs> Did you recognize his silhouette in any way? or the, No, they had a mask. But the, I think the second or third time, uh, he, and he said, you know, if something happens to me, it says, I did not commit suicide. Yeah. I did not run off the road and break my neck or something along those lines. Yeah. And he had the FBI follow him for about three years to make sure that nothing happened to him. Wow. Because if something happened to him, then boom, he's validated. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, George Knapp did a lot of research on, on who Bob is. He went to Albuquerque where he allegedly worked at Sandia mm-hmm. and go, he went to the public side of the Sandia library and found a phone book the time frame that Bob said he worked there and by golly guess what there's a Robert Lazar uh, phone number the yeah. phone number he gave the room number the guys he said that were in the same lab their numbers uh, they everything everything lined up then he went to the local paper and got a microfish going through the, the times that he said because Bob said I've been written up the local paper and said, said, Sandia professor learns to relax at 300 miles an hour on the weekend. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so we throw those big parties out in the, in yeah, the desert. No, yeah. <laughs> so, so he was racing this jet car at one of the drag strips and he made, you know, he made the papers. Right. There's, so there's a picture of Bob, of Bob. Yeah. Saying that he was, the, you know, they, he was, you know, at Sandia and he's a mm-hmm. nuclear physicist. The other thing is, those, those, anybody who's de- in, been involved in a classified environment, if you know something class is classified and I ask you a question, you can just say, no comment. Mm-hmm. Right. If I ask you a question or I ask you about someone and the person I'm asking you about is a fraud, you're not going to say no comment. You're going to say, you full of shit. I've never, <laughs> you know. I've never met him. I don't know who this, this guy is. Mm-hmm. But when, when Edward Teller, who hired, directly hired Bob Lazar, according to Bob, when he was asked, will you comment 
on whether or not uh, you hired Bob Lazar. He said, no comment. No comment. Oh. If Bob would have been a fraud, he would have said, I've never met the guy. The guy's a fraud. Yeah. Wow. He didn't. And everybody they have subsequently asked about it had basically said the same thing. No said comment. nothing. Right. The, the other thing is, when I was in Desert, during Desert Shield, I was at the Pentagon. I had Bob Lazar's uh, W-2 from his last pay, his last checks yeah. or his payment from the Navy mm-hmm. at S4. Mm-hmm. Huh. I had blocked out his social security number. But from what I understand, the, the area codes, the zip codes in, in, the, in the DC area started at 20201 through 20247. The late 30, early 40 block go to classified locations. I didn't know that, uh, but I was told they do. So, again, I'm in uniform. I'm an E6. Short, short haircut, start shirt, very sharp looking. I look at it, I look in the Pentagon directory for a department or a division the same as or similar to what's on Bob's W 2 and is had to do with the. Naval, not Naval Investigative Services, but along those lines. So I had some time, but I was waiting for a shuttle to head back to Andrews. Uh, and I, I decided I was going to go to this, this office, Navy office. Now, I'm an enlisted guy. A Navy admiral is not going to talk to an Air Force enlisted puke <laughs> <right>. <laughs> off the cuff. So I go in... And, and I, there's, a, there's a young uh, Lieutenant J.G. at the desk, and it was a young man, young man. <clears throat> and he said, sir, can you tell me where this location is? And I showed him Bob Lazar's W-2, and he looked at it. Just a minute. He walks into the Admiral's, the Two Stars office. He's in there maybe 40 seconds. He comes out. The Admiral will see you now. Oh. An admiral is going to see an Air Force oh. enlisted puke on the, <laughs> so you, on the you, fly. You done did something. Not, not likely. So I go in there and I give him a sharp salute. Yeah. And he, he said, at, he didn't say at ease. He said parade rest. So I'm standing there at parade rest. And he said, Sergeant, and he's, holding, he's holding Lazar's W-2. I said, I don't know where you got this thing. But I, if I ever see your face cross the threshold of my office ever again, you'll be the most sorriest son of a bitch in NCO United States military. Do you understand, Sergeant? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> With that, he puts Lazar's W-2 in the shredder. No oh, shit. He, and he, then he said, you're dismissed. Oh, no. Damn. Oh. That's crazy. <laughs> what? Shreds oh. it. Okay. But, that, but, that's, but that's, what it, that's what it takes to fill in the blanks. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. Bob, because that's something I've never heard before. Yeah, that's you know? new. That's, that's new. A, that's a cool little side story. Yeah, like yeah. That's, that's total confirmation that if, if someone in the military wanted to not comment, you know, quote unquote, not comment right. on the existence or, you know, admit that he worked for for some kind of compartmentalized program, whether it be a contract or military condoned, like it, it just, it, it confirms it, man. Like just the fact that he, he shredded the document and, I you mean, know. he wouldn't, one, I would not have, the, the Lieutenant uh, JG, whatever it was, would have said, said, never heard of it. <laughs> Give it back to me if it was phony. Yeah. But the fact that it had the right information on that right. minus minus the, it didn't say so, his name, right? You, no, it said Robert J. Oh, Lazar. Okay, I think it's, I think it just it's, didn't have his social. Didn't have his social. I, I blocked out his social Gosh, security right. number okay. in case, in, in case it got misplaced or whatever. I didn't. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't. I wanted to protect him. Yeah, Bob's a friend of mine. I mean, he's he's not a close close friend, but he, but he is a very much a friend. For sure, I like him. Uh, I adore his wife. Uh, he's he's. He's been places that you and I can't even dream of. <laughs> <laughs> he seems just oh, like I can he, imagine. He yeah. seems like a cool dude. I don't know. Uh, he he uh, is, uh, and he and he's kind. Yeah, Lisa, he's been kind to me. My, 
I have a picture uh, I posted on Facebook a couple different times of my son when he was just graduated from high school, so he's 17. We're at Bob Lazar's house uh, off of West Charleston in Las Vegas uh, before, he, you know, before he moved. And there's Bob sitting at his desk. His super computer, computer's behind him. And there's my son with his hand on his shoulder just smiling <laughs> to beat hell. And, That's cool. so cool. And it was, it was a week that my son James and I had spent a full week at the north fence line area 51. Wow. And they didn't know we were there. We were camouflaged. You know, yeah. I saw I showed you some of the pictures earlier yeah. of me out in the it's, desert. Yeah. He has like a like a Honda and it's tarped and there's like this camo tarp over it. Yeah. You can't even see it. Dude. Yeah. Okay. So I do remember that from your presentation uh at Lorian's yeah. thing. Uh, man, yeah. yeah. So for for uh, listeners that uh, don't know that side, I have so many more questions. But would you go a little bit and maybe tell like one or two stories about about how uh, your the title of your presentation was how to get into Area Fifty One, right? Or right, it, yeah, right. how to get to Area Fifty One and not get shot. And not get, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's yeah. tell about it and I said that probably the easiest way. I mean, I. I don't think so. I think there's a statute of limitations, uh, and I would deny it anyway, even if it's on tape. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was winter. No it, it was winter. Of, I think it was winter of seven of ninety three. I was at the North Fence Line. Allegedly, allegedly, yes. <laughs> Supposedly, in my dreams. Yes. Yeah. yeah, dreamlands, dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! Dreamland. And, right. <laughs> and I, uh, my then wife. Had I had I'd gotten a survival blanket, the types that have that are uh, aluminum foil on one side and day glow on the other, uh-huh. and, but they're filled with insulator, whatever it is. So yeah. two of them together had a uh, put camouf- uh, infrared suppressive desert camouflage in, in a quilt pattern on it, and then she made a poncho. So I'm now a low observable <laughs> with and a, and a hood, <laughs> a hood, and a That's poncho. So if I heard cool. a helicopter and I'm deaf. <laughs> but uh, if I heard a helicopter, all I had to do is crouch down and pull everything in there, and I had no infrared signature. Dude. And you can't see that from 10 feet away, let alone flying over. Whoa. Right. That. So because it's insulated, it's not irradiating heat there's, there's, outside. There's no heat. It's all inside. Yeah. Whoa. You just it turn was, into a boulder, basically. It was 30 <laughs> degrees, and I probably sweated a gallon of sweat. Damn. I mean, I was so nervous. And the thing about getting over to where I could see the base... I could see where the airplanes were going to take off. I could see the tracking cameras. But there was about six sets of hills in the foothills. Yeah. That I, I went over two of them in my heart. I mean, you probably could hear my heart all the way in Rachel. <laughs> and I said, no, nah, I, I, I got to turn around. So I, I got all the way out. Uh, I was never detected. Yeah. But I was nervous. So that's one way. Yeah. So I'm sorry to cut you, but like, so you say you could see where the airplanes were taking off. Does well, that mean? From, from, the north, from the north fence line, anything, any test aircraft yeah. that takes off from Area 51 will fly right over your head. Whoa. Whoa. So that's how you knew that the, the, uh, the, the wing, sorry. F, um, no, that Tona, the F-117s, F-117s was at Tonopah test different. range. This, okay. this I'm in the northern fence line of Area 51. Gotcha. Gotcha. So... I have a friend of mine, and, and he's, he still has a clearance, and he's still alive and well, so I won't give his real name, but he goes by Agent X. We all have nicknames. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, John Andrews was, was Spy One. Stu Brown from Popular Science is the Minister of Words. Uh, Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> I, he's a journalist, and he's yeah. a true journalist. Um, the late Mike Dornheim from Aviation Week, we call him the Ayatollah. <laughs> I mean, he was 100% Irish. He had a beard like yours and hair yes. like yours. I mean, it was like that. I mean, he looked like a mad Ayatollah. So we all come. And my nickname was the Great One. Oh, sweet. Yeah. That's Fitting. awesome. Yeah. Very fitting. And, yeah, that's and that, just, that, just, that just tickles the hell out oh, of me. But, the Great One. Yes. Um, <laughs> so it, it really, it, it like, I didn't expect... Uh, uh, the images and the photos that you that you've shown and I've seen of of you being inside of Area 51 and and the the trails that you took I didn't realize that the landscape was so like mountainous and rocky and that you could drive a car as far as you did I didn't know that that was 
you know, possible. And I, I remember you had spoken about the sensors and the way that you did the sensors in a specific order. Is that giving away they, too much? They have, they have, uh, on, and I believe it's illegal since. Oh, should since, I not? Since, <laughs> no, no I, I've, I've mentioned it m- multiple times in, in anger. Okay. Um, <laughs> That they don't have a right, uh, they, it's it's illegal for them to do it because it's not their property. Yeah, yeah. they don't have jurisdiction outside the fence line. Uh, that's left to the local authorities, and yeah. you call them in, or you bring in the national guard if necessary. But you see, the Lincoln County, uh, Nye County, or Esmeralda County Sheriff will, will handle you know that stuff. Military may hold you, or the contractor. Security people may hold you, right. but other than that, uh, uh, no. But the the, sens- the sensors are mass sensors. You drive over them, and the, the, what you what you do when you go out in the desert. And I'm going to have one. I now I, I now have a radio that I just plug in my cigarette lighter that already has preloaded all the military channels used <laughs> in the Nevada test site. Cool. <laughs> so if, as That's long as awesome. it's not encoded, I'll hear it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's a battery pack that goes with it. Last, it'll last three hours without being plugged, you know, plugged into the car. Yeah. So, um, but a frequency counter is a, it's a mass sensor. You got a large motor, truck, or whatever. You go over a sensor, it sends it sends a coded click. Yeah. This is sensor one zero one just went off. Ah, uh, now one zero two just went off, which means someone's driving up the road. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So what you do, you have a frequency counter. You'll get a beep. So you have a you have a rock with some uh, Daglo ribbon on it. You drop it. Go over and you hit the next beep. You drop it. Then you go over. You go find where the transmitter is, and it's battery powered, and it's a little screw antenna. You, you just there's a small little antenna about so, uh, and it's a it's a cannon plug screw. Uh-huh. You unplug that. You take the you take the the antenna off and set it no, you, 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 let me back up I you find that. it you clean it you know where you know where it is at so you wait about 20 minutes and then you drive down you just back down right so now 102 went off 101 went off oh now whoever was going off the road has turned around and left right so now you go and take the antennas off set them aside now you're going off the road you can drive all the way up with the right vehicle <laughs> You can drive all the way up to the top of the groom range. Wow. You can't see you can't see the base proper. You can see the the edges of the of uh, the lake bed, right? And the S and the uh, tall king radar they had there. I think it's been since been been removed. This is like I said, I've been going up there for thirty years. Mm-hmm. God, that's a long time. It's sure. a long time, man. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting old. Uh, but um, we're Jesus we're getting back number, to. Uh, how to how to get into Area Fifty? Oh yeah, I mean I just love those two stories. Dude. And they like, they have sensors that'll determine. They know whether it's a, whether it's a, a, a man walking, uh, or a dog, or a coyote, yeah. or wild horses. Yeah. Right. And you had mentioned the, about the horses, yes. right? That was like so. If someone someone really wanted to get in there, I mean, boy, you're risking your <laughs> butt by doing it. They're not going to shoot you, but you're going to wish. You're going to wish they, they, they gave you at least one bullet and say, okay, go on the other road. We are a bang. We, we know you, the decisions you made. Yes. Because they're going to make life miserable for you mm-hmm. and expensive. Oh. Uh, they won't kill you. Sounds expensive. They won't shoot you. But like uh, Lear and I were told one time, if you decide to go down this road, you're going to be interviewed by some very unfriendly types. Yeah. But it's a different story. But... Uh, so if you were on horseback, bareback, uh, you'd have to have a horse that would know to come back and get you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you, would start, you would start at sun, sunset, and you would, meet, you would, you would start uh, near the Frantica Lakes area. You'd take a road way back there, and that's, that's sort of the south end of Area 51, and you'd go back there on horseback. So the the heats, if they're looking at you through infrared, no, they're listening for the sound. Oh, okay. That's what they know. They know the sound of a horse walking through the desert. Uh, I mean, they have uh, it's it's like it's like a sonar technician yeah. in a submarine. They have they have a library of of sounds yeah. that they've been able to certify that. <coughs> excuse me, 
that this is in fact a horse or this is in fact a cow. Right? Yeah. Or oh, a calf. So, so maybe the sounds like the clicking sounds of the spurs or something on the yeah, on, and, on, and, a, and on a, a they, saddle. They may even have they may even have load sed cells out there that determine the weight. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But oh. if <coughs> excuse me. I'm actually gonna grab another beard. If you grab me one too, yeah. If we're you want to stop or Oh no, we're good. No. Uh, if we were to go on horseback, one, you're a fool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two, I'm not recommending it. Definitely. But if you did, the horse could take you almost anywhere you wanted to go. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to have. Uh, you'd have to have something that would uh, mask your your IR signature, and yeah. that uh, poncho yeah. uh, would work, and a, and. Provisions, you'd have to have enough water. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the most critical thing. Food, you can do without for a long time. Water. No, I carry my so MREs yeah. right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Got a couple of weeks in there. Yeah. 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 Um, so that you know, so there's, a, there's there's so if someone walked in and, and if they were trying to mimic the sound of a of a horse or something like that, the senses would be able to would know they would that know. it was a man. Yeah. <sighs> Dude. So, and I don't know if they have load cells out there. If something steps on it and said, well, you know, last time a horse came through, it weighed X number of uh, kilos. And this one has, oh, X number of kilos plus 10 or 15 yeah, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. So, so you've actually been on the, the, the wrong side of, of, a, of, a, of a couple red dots on your chest, yes, right? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. was that just like, were you scared shitless? I mean, the first time it happened? Or no, you, no, <laughs> because there's too much paperwork involved shooting the civilian. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the only reason, they, that, that, that's the only reason they didn't do it. I mean, there are some people out in the desert, I know for a fact, would like to have me whacked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this was primarily back in the '90s when I was we were really opening up the kimono and see what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. there. So uh, now I was uh, 1996. It was June. It was about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, John Lear and I are at the fence line of Tonopah Test Range. Now Tonopah is where the F-117s were okay. based. I'm getting it now. Got it. And at desert, you know, during Desert Storm, they left Tonopah, and when they returned, they had they had started closing down Tonopah Test Range, and the F-117 bed den was now at Holloman Air Force Base in, in Alamogordo, New Mexico. So this is six years after the F-117s left. And I had, I had talked to a gentleman who was uh, a communication contractor with the federal government, and, and he had, we were talking on one of my drill weekends when I was working on my A-12 Black Route at the Minnesota Air Guard Museum. And he said, yeah, he was just at Tonopah for six weeks. They finished installing, and he was just signing off on it. the most sophisticated fiber optic sy uh, communication systems in the Department of Defense. Wow, damn. And also mentioned they had, they had put a third perimeter around the flight line. They oh. don't do that to a base that's in caretaker status. Right. Huh. So uh, John Lear right there, we have night vision goggles. It's 11 o'clock at night. We have our lawn chairs. You always tape up your uh, your pant legs just so critters can't crawl up your pant legs. Yep. And we see three armored personnel carriers with the lights off. One coming from the south, from the west, from the east. Lights out. I stand up and yell real loud, hey, we're good guys. We're taxpayers. <laughs> and Love that. all of a sudden, we had floodlights on us and little red dots. <laughs> oh, no, dude. <laughs> And Blair hasn't moved. His feet's still up on the on the uh, on the fence. <laughs> yeah, on the four four strands of barbed wire. Right. So there's a truck. There's a truck coming down the BLM side of the fence, and some guy, guy parked behind John's truck, and some and the lights are still floodlights are still on us. And the little red dots are still on us, and then this guy comes around. He has a hand on his nine millimeter. He's in uh, desert BDUs. Uh, he said, you're in a restricted area. I'm ordering you to leave. And I said, sir, we're in public lands, and we don't have to go anywhere. He says, you're in a restricted area, and I'm ordering you to leave. And I pulled out. I had an aeronautical map issued by the federal government in my hand. 
pulled it out, turned my flashlight on my on my uh, I had a flashlight with me. It's before cell phones. They were really something. That's how old I am. <laughs> I had a, I had to go like this. Uh, <laughs> flash went to Mar- and I said, according to the official government map, that lists lists the longitude and latitude to the second of the restricted area line at 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 Tonopah test range. If you look at the base of the fence post where my buddy has his feet, you'll see a USGS medallion that gives the longitude and latitude to the second. Wow. I'm in public lands. I'm on BLM property, and I can be here for 15 consecutive days without your permission or anybody else for that matter. Hell and yeah. he's fuming. He's just huffing and puffing. I want to see some ID. I said, who are you? <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm Captain So-and-so from ASI, Advanced Security, Inc. And I said, you're a rent-a-cop. Oh, you don't have jurisdiction shit. this side of the fence. And he's just getting really, really pissed. He said, I've, I've been deputized by the, uh, by, uh, the state of Nevada, uh, Esmeralda, Lincoln, and Nye County to uphold the laws of the state of Nevada and the federal government. I said, well, good for you. <laughs> he said, here's my little he badge says, I said, I said, tell you what. I wanted, I wanted to jerk this guy's chain. I love doing that. And it's called stepping on your dick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it never yeah, really yeah. works out really well on, on this, this end. So he hands me his ASI, his Vance, Advanced Security, Inc. Security badge. I look at it and I said, this is not a valid form of ID, and I handed it back to him. I, I said, I want to see something issued by the state or federal government. Dude. His jaws are tightened. I mean, you could, you could just see, you could just see the, the veins popping in his head. Because he knows you're right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so he pulls out his, his Nevada driver's license, and I don't have my reading glasses on. Oh, okay. So I gave it back to him, and I gave him my Minnesota. At the time, I lived in Minnesota. Gave him my Minnesota driver's license. Lear reaches over, gives his, he hands it to a guy on the south side of the fence. He walks over to the super, you know, the supervisor. Supervisor has the thing, turns on the, the dome light, and I hear him say, oh, shit, it's good all in Lear. <laughs> 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 the lights went off. The red dots went away, but we knew they weren't going to do anything. Yeah, yes. That's so awesome. And, uh, yeah, the moral of that story is uh, know the law, boys and girls. Know the and, law. Know and the law. don't break it. I mean, you're, right, you're you're paying. They're not going to shoot you, they're not going to torture you, but they could la- they can make your life, especially if you have a rent a car, a mm, living hell. They're going to yeah. tow it to Pinoche, which is a hundred miles away. Oh, so so you're going to have to tow, pay the tow company charge from wherever you were picked up at to Pinoche, and you're going to pay for him to come back to <laughs> Alamo or or Ash Springs. Um, then you have to appear in court. Now, this is a rent-a-car. Right. So you have to somehow get to Pinoche. You're, you're, at, you're in uh, Ash Springs, Nevada, which is a pretty little town, but there's no Ubers there. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have, to get, you have to get back to Las Vegas, explain to Hertz or Avis or whoever it is that your car has been impounded in Pinoche, which is now... 200 miles away because you're 100 miles from Las <laughs> yeah, Vegas. Shit. And, uh, and they probably slap a big fine on top of that too, right? Oh, yeah. It's just, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you thousands of dollars. Just compounds. So, yeah. so stupidity at times is painful. Yeah. And, and uh, yes. I've, I've known guys to have, I've known of guys to have it done. Man, that sucks. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. But it's, I love, that's one reason I, uh, when I retired, I, I moved to, uh, to Tucson. Uh, I love the desert. I love the beauty of the desert. Me too. Right now it's so friggin' hot. I, you know, I, I told my wife, I'll come back when it cools down a bit. Well, it's supposed to be 110 all week long. I said, well, I'll see you when it cools down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not getting any cooler in Texas, hey. I'll tell you that. It's supposed to be 97 in Seattle tomorrow. Oh, my oh, God. 97. People don't have air conditioning in Seattle. Jeez. It always goes oh, no. down at night. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But it's... it's. I, th- I think it wasn't until the 1980s that Seattle actually had 100 degrees for the first time. Yeah. Ever. There's only a couple of cities that have never hit 100 degrees. Yeah. That kind of blew my mind when we were in California. Uh, we were talking... Uh, 
to that one time I, I was abducted by aliens. Yeah. The uh, from the Br- Bree and um, Jamie. Jamie, yes. Yeah, Bree and Jamie, yeah. and they were like, they were like, yeah, well, some of us don't have air conditioning. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? And they were like, yeah, we don't. We just don't need it. We don't use it. I was like, you don't have an air conditioner? Nobody does, And they dude. were like, no, we don't have... I was like, that's so weird. My house is 69 degrees it feels every day. amazing <laughs> like, in here. And there's no way I'm not going to have an air conditioner. Are you shitting me? No. Yeah. I don't think so. I keep our house at 78. <laughs> oh, God. It's too hot, man. Oh, man. I couldn't do that. <laughs> I couldn't do that. My wife would love that. She likes... She's always so cold. Even, even in, yeah. a, in the wintertime... We'll bump it up to like 70, 71, but it's at least 69 every day. Like 69, that's just the way it is. Hell yeah, yeah. bro. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. So, so I'm, uh, uh, there, there's, other, there's other ways you can, you can get into Area 51 if you want to risk it. And it'd be coming in through Mercury where they don't have the sensors. Oh. But you have, to, you, know, you have to go across an awful lot of desert and you got to do it at night. And you got to hope that's when the scorpions are out. Yes. And that's when the rattlesnakes are out. Uh-uh. That's why my favorite time to go out uh, <laughs> when we were rock climbing up the top of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Groom Range. It, it was, uh, I think all the snakes were all hibernating. Yeah. But was I, it like during the winter, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I was on top, I was on top of uh, the Groom Range with a guy we call the Swiss Mountain Bat. His name's Mine Rad. He's from the Zurich area. Huh. And he's flying. He's one of the interceptors. Oh, that's cool. There's, a, there's an original group, like I was saying before. We all have our own names. And Mine Rad was the Swiss Mountain Bat because he liked bat, you know, Batmobile, you know, bat birds, you know, yeah. Yeah. black airplanes and stuff. And he's from, he's from Switzerland. That's yeah. cool. That's so awesome. it's. Uh, no, it was it was a small group of guys. It, it was a, a a once in a life lifetime gathering of we all from different backgrounds. All of us. Yeah, uh, it's like the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but it's like this yeah. crazy <laughs> hobby that you, you you don't like. No one really knows knew, knew about it. At, even yeah, at the I, time. I came home from a road trip with, with my first wife, and she said. I said, what have you done? I said, what do you mean? She said, the chief of police of Tulare, California is called <laughs> looking for Jim Goodall. <laughs> Shit. I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, where's Tulare? You know, it's, it's, on, it's on US 99 you know, near Bakersfield, between Bakersfield and Fresno. Uh-huh. It's the home of haagen ice cream. Oh, yeah. they hey, wanted, delicious. They wanted, an unusual, they wanted an exotic sounding European name to a, a, an American product. Yeah. So it's made in... It, I'm assuming it still is made in Tulare. It's a cute little town. <laughs> I did not know that. Okay. So they just so call I, it. Okay. I, 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 call, I call this guy up. And I said, this is Jim Goodall. I want to see speed to Chief Roger Hill. Just a minute. Roger gets on the phone. Jim, said, I'm glad I finally tracked you down. Said, said, said my deputy, com- my, my commandant, and my, my uh, chief of detectives, we want to meet you to go out in the desert and look at stuff. <laughs> look at Area 51. <laughs> Holy so were, shit! Yeah, so so, so they were like, dude, we we've heard that you you like to go out to Air Fifty One. We want to come yeah, along. And we, okay. we, the, the first the first night I ever spent the night on the top of Freedom Ridge, uh, it was it was myself. It was Stu Brown from Popular Science. It was Glenn Campbell from the Area Fifty One Research Center. It was Tom Luttrell, uh, Roger Hill. I can't remember David's last name. He was chief of homicide and then uh, chief of detectives. Whoa. And all of a sudden, and we're, sleep, we're sound asleep. Uh, and all of a sudden, we have flashlights on our face. Oh, we're, on top, we're on top of Freedom Ridge. Oh, oh, no. oh, <laughs> what the hell's going on? Says, says, Said you're an restricted, you know, the restricted area bullshit again. Yeah. Said no, we're not. Said, <laughs> said you can't. You're like, like covered up. You don't even like get says, out of your bed. <laughs> said you, you can't. You can't. Yeah. It says you're not allowed to take any photography up. But what are you doing up here? I said we're bird watchers. <laughs> I mean, I, you're not. And lying. I, and I heard. I heard. I heard. Uh, I heard the you know, the guy on the radio. I said they refuse to show us ID. I said you lying son of a bitch. You didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the Lincoln County sheriffs. There was there was Air Force Wackenhut and uh, Air and Wackenhut and Lincoln County well Lincoln County Sheriff Wackenhut and Air Force th- three different people groups up there and the uh, 
the, the uh, I can't remember the sheriff's name, deputy sheriff's name. I just, he's sort of Barney Fife type guy. Yeah. He had a squeaky voice. <laughs> said, I know that name. <laughs> I said, that name sounds familiar. <laughs> and then he said, uh, says, I'm, Stu was using his, his camera bag for a pillow. Mm-hmm. So I want to see what's in that camera bag. I said, you have a search warrant? <laughs> no. I said, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a camera bag. We know it has a camera in it. And I said, this is a wallet. And you assume it has money in it. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you have a search warrant, no, we're not going to open up the camera right. bag. Yeah. And they start you know, saying something else. And they finally started to dis- disperse. They had asked... Stu Brown for ID, they'd asked Glenn, and they'd asked me, but they didn't ask the, the four cops. Hmm. And Roger Hill said, those guys, all the questions they were asking and demands they were making, they were trampling all over your First Amendment, Second Amendment, you know, you know all your rights. Yeah. He said, if they, if they would have asked, I would have announced, I'm chief of police. Yeah. That Damn. would have shut them down right then and there. So, <laughs> yeah. so they disperse. <clears throat> we're, we're all wide awake. It's 3.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. So I put a night vision on, and the and whites. I mean, Freedom Ridge is surrounded by about thirty guys. Oh <laughs> shit! Hey, could you a salute? And all of a sudden, all thirty guys. Give you a salute. <laughs> oh, so everybody's so flicking good. y'all up, and you guys are like, Fuck yeah, you, man. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and and this was a time when the interceptors, as we called ourselves, and that was an unofficial name, the Dreamland <laughs> interceptors. Um, one of the guys actually made a patch and I didn't get it. I don't know why I didn't get one, but <laughs> my heart isn't broken. Uh, but <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a time frame before 9-11. Uh, it was a time, uh, time frame before all this. Uh, it's a different world before. It is. It is. It, it's a different century. Yeah. And this is before the internet. Truly, and if, yeah. and I'm sure kids are saying there was something. I mean, the internet hasn't always been here. <laughs> yeah. No, this is before the. This is before the. You know, the internet. Yeah. And it's. You had to go out and do it in person. Yeah. You, you couldn't. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to know something about whatever is happening, if you want to know something about Area 51, you had to get on a plane or get on your car and drive to Rachel, Nevada which is the north end of area 51. Yeah. And uh, try to you know try to get fr- make friends with some of the locals to you know learn some of the ins and outs or whatever. Right. You had to take you had to go out and put get your your shoes dirty. Yeah. yeah. That's what always irritated me about the news readers on the alphabets. Uh, the people who are getting pictures of the F117 and tonal Pontesians are people like myself actually a right. lot of my stuff. Yeah. And they could have done a live broadcast as an F-117 flew over there, but they didn't want to get their floor shines dusty. Right, yeah. yeah. And they're not journalists anymore. Stu Brown is, the, I think, the last journalist I've ever known. I mean, he is... Uh, uh, no, I, I, I can't... I, I have to take that back. All the guys I know from, from Aviation Week, those guys are journalists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They do report the news <clears throat> and, as, as it really happened. Right, right. And um, man, yeah, I feel like that that age is uh, that era is so lost nowadays. I mean, we hit, we, hit, we had just done a, a, a podcast last night about this kind of topic. Uh, is that everything's just a headline now? Everything's clickbait, and no one really wants to do any research and get out there and get their feet dirty and shit like that. Like everybody's, it's all just very shallow journalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a I have a dear friend who's who's in the UFO uh, you know ufology uh, business. Really, that is his true passion. It's Michael Schratt. Yeah, yeah. He was awesome. He has he has put together, I think it's twenty two of the most significant UFO encounters ever. In an eighty or ninety page, no, maybe, maybe it's not that long. Maybe it's it's right around eighty page ebook on Amazon. It's fully illustrated. It has supporting documents, and you saw his presentation yeah, in San Francisco. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, and I've known I've known Michael for over I don't I don't think twenty years, but uh, at least fifteen. I think the world of him. Yeah, he's he, he's, he's awesome. brilliant. He's he is a he's his own worst critic. Um, and he and he 
he doesn't realize how, how people appreciate what he's done. Right. I mean, I've known him all this time, and San Francisco was the first time I heard him give a presentation. Now, wow. we had sat down for three or four hours at my house in Arizona yeah. and talked UFOs and talked stuff, and he even videotaped me uh, two or three times. Um, uh, and I, my backdrop was all my Blackbird instruments. Hell yeah. I have a mock meter that says 3.24. Nice. Oh. Yes. I have a SAS that was in the M21, the drone launch Blackbird. And they had just taken it out after a flight because you know, something was, was uh, they were they're getting an, an error message. And they, so I just swapped it out. On that flight, the airplane had the mid-air collision and crashed. Oh. So... All my instruments have gone at least Mach 3. Whoa. That's cool. The, the yeah. dashboard, the dials, and yeah. the, that's yeah. so cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. And that's, those I, are my treasures. I wanted to say this really quick. Uh, uh, there was a photo uh, that you posted on Facebook of you, uh, or maybe it was somebody. Somebody was sitting in a Blackbird. It's me. That was the okay. I was like, well. I'm, I'm I'm standing in my A12 Blackbird, yeah, and behind me a bunch of army trucks. I'm yeah, standing next yeah. To- I didn't realize because I always thought that the 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 plane was a lot bigger, but this thing is like, oh man, no, it's, it's stealthy, huge. It, it is. It is. You you don't realize how big the Blackbird is maybe, until you're on top of it. Yeah, maybe it just is the, the chines are illusion. The chines are 12 feet apart or Whoa. 12 feet wide. Yeah. Does that mean the the wingspan? Is? No, the front body. Oh, the body that yeah, it, and it swoops yeah. out like into yeah. A, yeah. And and oh. and to engineers and drafts people, and this came from Ben Rich, and I was blessed to have Ben Rich, who was the retired late retired president of the Skunk Works, and Kelly Johnson's right hand man. Um, he he said Kelly's requirement when they designed the Blackbird, there are no French curves. Every curve. On a blackbird, is a true circle. Cool. Uh, yeah. Cool. So you put you put a big enough circle, you you know you can get any radius you want. Oh, interesting. Oh. So wait, does that mean like it's all like all the curves are made of like if you put a big circle that it's yes. following the circumference yeah. of, of a certain yeah. Radius? If you have a template and it's 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 this is a, based on a thirty six foot or thirty six inch circle right yeah and that's the way you put that on there it'll perfectly match the profile that's wow awesome. that's cool yeah, yeah that's that's really cool. cool and the, the other the other thing i i helped take apart two blackbirds i took apart nine you know nine three one my a12 we took it apart in two and a half days wow wow it took the guys from hill air force base six weeks to take apart <laughs> 981 that's the one that went to the uh uh hill museum in uh, uh, ogden utah yeah but the guys I had working, I mean, the, the guys who took the uh, the the, tra- the uh, SR seventy one C trainer to Hill, they used die grinders and you know, to to cut the. There's eighteen wing beams you have to cut through. Like angle angle grinders with the with the discs on it. Yeah. Is that yeah? Okay. Our guys use a K twelve rescue saw. I mean, it's a twelve inch gas powered. Yeah. And. Just uh, no. These are air powered because they won't allow get. No, those it was gas powered, and we cut the wings off. And the thing about it, the wing spars are thirty thousand sheet titanium, with a machine spar cap top and bottom, and we had cut through all but a half inch of one spar cap. And this ten thousand pound engine to sell is still sitting there, Whoa. hasn't moved. <laughs> and the guy with the K twelve, he's 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 tapping, he's tapping on the because <laughs> he doesn't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it's chained up on a uh, a um, oh, like a hoist. No, it was a, a forklift. It, uh, it, was okay. a, it was good for it was good for ten tons. Yeah. ten ten. And, we're, and this is a ten thousand pound engine to sell, and outer wing panel, and. We didn't realize. We thought we had emptied all the hydraulic, I mean, all the pneumatic pressure in the oleos. There's a valve on top, so you can collapse the oleos or whatever. Well, we thought they, you know, they they had been emptied, and when that ten thousand uh, pounds of wing was finally relieved from the fuselage, it went up like this. Oh, I mean, oh, this. Damn. I mean, instantly it went up about eighteen <laughs> inches, and. The guy up there thought that the, air, the airplane was falling over. He about had a heart attack. We oh, all did. Shit. I mean, scared. We thought he thought they, we thought the engine itself was dropping because, you know, our vantage point is look, looking at the wing and the and, and it looks like right. the, the engine itself was going down. Oh <laughs> my god! But 
we had the uh, uh, the way we moved the, the Blackbird from Palmdale to the Minnesota Air Guard Museum is I scrounged two C5s uh, to move it. What's a two C5? A C5, uh, two of them, C5. the number two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Two Lockheed C5 Galaxy airlifters, the world's largest, the Air Force's largest airplane. Oh, right, okay. right. The front opens up, the back opens up. Uh -huh. They usually look like a gigantic, uh, the old ones look like a gigantic pickle. The okay. European one, now they're all gray. But the floor is, is 121 feet long, 19 feet wide. I think the lowest point in the cargo bay is at 13 feet. It's, so as long as the object is no bigger than that, it'll fit inside the, uh, the black, uh, the, it will sit, sit inside, inside the C5. That's awesome. So I had, I had figured out that a, an A-12 Blackbird with the wings cut off at Wing Station 112 by taking the outer wheels and brake assembly off that we had one and a half inch of clearance on the floor wow. to, to move a C, to move the Blackbird in. Dang. And if it was if it was a little bit if we didn't have quite enough room, then you get to come along between the two landing area and you torque it in. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, just shove it in there <laughs> and, I, and I had I had three chief master sergeants you know really heading it up because I'd gone I'd gone to Andy Hofdahl who was a chief master sergeant uh -huh. uh, of maintenance and uh, chief master sergeant Billy Flash Peter they both had 40 plus years working on Lockheed airplanes and they uh, uh, they they headed up the team and there was there was another. Uh, there was another chief. I can't remember. Oh no, it was uh, Buzz Carroll. And then we had uh, a couple other people. And at the time, I was I was a, I was a uh, tech sergeant. What happened? Oh, uh, my camera just stops every now and then. <laughs> it gets hot. I think. Oh. All right. I'm gonna press record again to see what happens. Ta da dun dun. Boom. Dun, dun, dun. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> and little, we're little camera back. Camera overheat. Camera overheatness yeah, dude. happens in Texas, man. <laughs> uh, Jim, I, so I had I have a couple of two two main idea questions. Um, we've talked a lot about your expertise in the Blackbird, your experiences with John Lear and Bob Lazar, awesome stories about sneaking on to Area 51 within your rights, you know. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask, you know, the more maybe UFO-related things. I know that you've been curious about, you know, look always looking up, as you said in the, in the beginning of the, of the show, but have you ever had a personal experience or when you took your friends out, was it the intent to see ufos or just oh, every, secret military every every time i've been in the desert i mean even around tucson i'm one i i don't i don't i don't have any directional hearing i only hear out of one ear yeah. so if i see a sound i gotta look all over the place but i'm constantly <laughs> even at night i'll sit out in my backyard that i have the the lights off around the pool and, and i have the lights most of the lights off in the house and i'll just sit out and i'll just watch the sky and i say all right, you son of a bitch! I'm here. <laughs> Abduct me. I mean, I, I yeah. really, I've been around a lot. I I'm not I'm not a, I, I don't think I, I would enjoy a, an anal probe. <laughs> I don't know what they're looking for. Uh, I mean, I know I, I know there, I promise you. I know they they've run into a lot of people with their head up their ass. <laughs> so maybe that's what they were doing. Um, I don't know. I just there's too many things that I've run into in my life. That tells me that we're not alone. Probably the most important thing was a letter that Ben Rich wrote to John Andrews. Uh, we call him Spy One at, at Testers. Anytime John and I called on the telephone, talked on the telephone, which was almost daily uh, for 20 years. It was always on his nickel. This before cell phones. <laughs> we always started out testing one, two, three, testing, testing. This is John. Uh, Andrews, a.k.a. Spy One, and Jim Goodall, a.k.a. The Great One. We're going to be talking about Area 51. We're talking about you know, Senior Crown. We're going to be talking about Tacit Blue, Have Blue, uh, Testing 1, 2, 3. Uh, we're ready to begin, and then we start. <laughs> <laughs> Just so in case anybody's listening. <laughs> and, and the reason, reason they did this, John and I had phone conversation I was on the road, and he was on the road, but I knew where he was going to be. And he was in Dallas, and I don't know where the hell I was at. And I called him up, and I said, uh, 
we need we need to put together a low observable uh, glider with electric motor in it wrapped in RAM with a Instamatic camera with a with a little motor driven that after its time and distance it would start taking pictures overhead pictures area 51 and then do a 180 and come back and crash land we didn't care if it crashed it'd yeah. be foam yeah about three weeks later i get a phone call at work my wife doesn't i don't even know what my phone number was i get a phone call at work <laughs> said jim this is this is so and so from uh, security oh no he said uh I understand that you and Andrews are thinking about flying a, a RC airplane over Area 51 to take pictures. <laughs> I'd recommend you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, how in the hell did he know? I mean, this yeah. this is before really a lot before you know large computers that would do that would analyze trillions of terabytes or, right. of, of data. Damn. Yeah, there wasn't the NSA wasn't listening yet. I don't know what it was. I have to, I have to assume it was, it was one of the alphabets. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, I was given a name by the interceptors, primarily Stu Brown, the minister of words. He's the one who refers me to the great one, or the senator, because I've always had white hair, and I usually I almost <laughs> always wore a suit. And, um, oh, God, I hate when that happens. My mind just went. <laughs> I'm, as, oh, I'm asking geez. if you've ever seen a UFO yourself, and we're we're kind of – we're kind of uh, you. You, well, you went into the story about uh, like the, why well, the, the let, I love it. No, I'm not. The, the letter, the letter from Ben Rich to John Andrews, it was June of, of '86, yeah. a long time ago. He said both Kelly and I are. Cause John sent him a letter, and uh, less than a week later, he responded on his corporate letterhead. Wow. Ben R. Rich, president of the Lockheed Adva- Ad- Advanced Development Programs. Yeah, the Skunk Works. Yeah, and in his own handwriting, Ben says that uh, both he and but because John a- John Andrews said, "Do you believe in UFOs?" There's two categories: both man-made and extraterrestrial. And Ben wrote back, "Both Kelly and I are firm believers in both categories. Both both are possible." Ooh. Uh, says we refer to ours as unfunded opportunities, and he underlines the U, the F, and the O. Oh. oh, oh, that's cool. He says, but beware, there are people who, who will lead you astray and could do you harm. Mm. And just before, now to, to put it this in perspective, for 25 years, I spoke to Ben Rich. He either called me or I called him. Now, he was the president of the Skunk Works, and I was, a, I was an NCO in the Minnesota Air Guard on you know, one weekend a month. I mean, I was never in the defense industry uh, in any other way, but we talked at least once a quarter for 25 years. Yeah. And he was dying of esophageal cancer. He was at USC Medical Center. I think it was Christmas in 95 or 96. He died 10 days later. And we were talking about John, the late John Andrews because he had passed away of cancer. And that was the saddest funeral i've ever been he was like my brother and uh ben and i are talking about john and we talked about you know the aurora and and stuff like that and he and uh he said and advanced stuff and i mentioned he started talking about ufos and and ben rich told me to my ear my only good ear (laughs) he said jim we have things out in the desert and he wasn't referring to area 51 said we have things out in the desert that is 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. Mm. Not what you think you can build in 50 years, but what you can comprehend. Oh, wow. And if you've seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. I said, Ben, you want to expand upon that? He said, no. <laughs> and there's so much, so much had the nerve to die 10 days later. So, oh, I mean, I was, it was, he, he had promised if... Uh, if he had lived any longer, he was going to do an interview with me. Oh, Dang. No holes barred. And, but wow. he passed. Man. Uh, wow, man. But the, the, the other part that leads me to believe that we're not alone, uh, for a couple of years I was a docent at Pitt, Pitt Peak National Observatories outside of Tucson. They have 22 optical telescopes, anywhere from a small 6-inch 
to a four meter, that's 13 feet across, a 30 yeah. pound primary mirror. Mm -hmm. And the uh, 2.1 meter uh, teles uh, radio, the optical telescope of, of the 22 are up there was used by Caltech for five years using adaptive optics and re remote operation from Pasadena. Uh, they went into a small area of the Milky Way and over the course of five years, they identified 8,000 exoplanets. Jesus. And I was, uh, they, had, they had a new, uh, I won't get into that, f for reasons I decided not to be a docent anymore. I wasn't happy. Mm. But just before I left, we had a meeting of all the docents and a lot of the astronomers. And the, I can't remember who, uh, I think it was the head astronomer from uh, from the they call it uh, NOAO National Optical Astronomy Observatories. Mm -hmm. Told us he had just gotten back from a conference where all the all the astronomers and all the telescopes around the world doing exoplanet research got together and, and started throwing numbers around, and they they uh, came to a conclusion based on. You know, based on mathematics, you know, probability, whatever, mm -hmm. that for every star in the universe, not the solar system, the not the galaxy, in the universe, for every star, there are one and a half planets in the universe. And out of that incredible number of planets, he said, they calculate that there are two billion, and that's with a B, mm -hmm. two billion Earth-like planets orbiting a similar sized brown dwarf star like our sun mm -hmm. yeah. in an inhabitable zone with liquid water. Damn. Now our, our, our solar system is four and a half billion years old. The universe is 14 and a half billion. So right. they've, there's, some, there's some Earths out there that's had a 10 billion year head start on technology. Yeah. Yeah. And look, look where we came in a hundred years, look where we came since 1947, when the Roswell incident happened. Before there was, there weren't, there weren't, there weren't uh, uh, fiber optics. Yeah. You know, there wasn't Kevlar. There, you know, there weren't yeah. transistors, transistors. There weren't code. Velcro. All this that came yeah. from nothing to boom in a very, very narrow period of time. Right. Uh, all around the time of the Roswell incident. Yep. So, based on the, the the, just pure numbers. When you have two billion Earths, the probability of a of an intelligent life form being formed is really good. Yeah. And they've all had a probably a big head yeah. start on us. And to you know to quote Jodie Foster's character in Contact, the movie Contact, if we're if we're the only ones, what a waste of space. <laughs> yeah, love that. I mean, that. we're an insignificant solar system in an insignificant galaxy, in an insignificant corner of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> We're alone? Yeah, I have bridge I can sell you out here in the desert. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, yeah, the odds, uh, if you're into the UFO thing or the alien thing, the the odds are in your favor, you know, of, of it being something legit. I mean... That's pretty arrogant of mankind to say, hey, we're the only superior being in, in the universe. Right, right. That's yeah. a big universe. Yeah. Yep. That's a big, big universe. Yeah, and, and we were talking earlier on how, you know, now of, officially, you know, the government's saying that we have craft not of this planet, and it's like, okay, uh, it's weird how, like, We've waited all these years to hear those words spoken, and it's almost, in a way, still not good enough. Yeah. You know, like, nobody's, like, buzzing about it. <laughs> nobody's talking about it, except well, for, obviously, people I, like I us. I called but. Bob Lazar. Yeah. I called his wife. I, I have her number, and I have Bob's number, too. But I called I called his wife first, and uh, she was delighted to hear from me. And I said, is Bob around? I'm saying, Doc Skinner's standing next to me. And... Uh, she I says, Bob around. I said, yeah, he's in the lab. Let me go get him. So Bob came on. Hey, how's it going? I said, how does it finally feel to be vindicated? He said, initially, it was a real rush. I was just <laughs> thrilled to death. But then 
without any supporting photography or imagery or artifacts, um, he says, I think it, it, may, it may be a diversion of something else. There, you know, a lot of times when, when, the, when the poop hits the fan over here is because the assholes are doing something over here. They don't want to <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and, awesome. And that's, I mean, that's, unfortunately, that's the world we live in today. Yeah, yeah. And it's such an odd time for them to decide to want to drop that information when there's so much going on that people aren't really paying I mean, attention. I mean, Russia, Russia, Russia didn't work. Uh, impeachment didn't work. Uh, pandemic didn't work. Riots haven't worked. An alien invasion. I mean, that's that should bring a stop to the world for a day or two. So yeah. I'm, I'm expecting. I'm expecting the mother, the the Death Star to be yeah. come out from behind the moon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we told you. <laughs> yeah. we told yeah. you. No, yeah. do I? You know, do I believe in UFOs? Absolutely. If. Alien, some, alien technology vehicles. Yes. I, UFOs from, out, from outside this planet. You know, yeah. from, it's, its origins are somewhere you know, terrestrial or extraterrestrial, yeah. whatever I'm going to call it. There was rumblings when the movie E.T. came out. Steven Spielberg had tried to get that movie funded for, for a whole bunch of years. And everybody le- looked at him and laughed at him and said, yeah, you want an alien to come out to play with the kids and whatever? Give me a break. <laughs> play with the kids. But there was a fe- there was a feeling. Uh, there, there's an organization within the Central Intelligence Agency that if if you're promoting an idea or trying to promote an idea that they're you know that they're agree with, they'll fund you. Yeah. And they and they said sort of almost out of the middle of nowhere, funding came down uh, from. A hundred million dollars, something like that, became available to uh, fund the, the filming and the initial making and seed money for movie ET. Wow! Yeah, because I'm making a connection here. Because the government, and whether whether it's our government or theirs, right, oh. right, we don't know. <coughs> we don't know who's in charge. Oh. It's like it's like the old Abbott and Costello. Who's on first? What? Who's on <laughs> yeah, second? Yeah. I don't know who's on third. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. who's on second. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> What's on third? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, what are they? What are they trying to hide? Yeah. Well, so uh, there's a documentary uh, I just watched called "Out of the Shadows," and it has and it has a lot to do with the CIA's involvement in Hollywood and basically any big studio that wants to pass a movie. They if it has anything to do with government things and whatever it somebody from the cia is going to come down and and have a chat with you and make sure and look through the script i mean this is all an insider's testimony no, no, i i, I but, worked in hollywood and i've known i've known people who've been in the business yeah and, ever, and like i was told by by a couple of people said don't give the spooks more credit than they're worth. Okay. They got a job. Interesting. And some of them really hate their job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I got to go to work today. I got to spy on so-and-so. Oh, shit, I'm tired of this, you know. Yeah. I just, you know, I just want to go pump gas down at the, uh, down at the, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, love station or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. That's a refreshing uh, point of view. Perspective. Yeah, because yeah, all, I mean, all I want to hear is, is like, oh, they're. Trying well, to control like, like the when, the, when, when the first F one seventeen crashed near Bakersfield, mm-hmm. uh, Ross Mel Hare was a pilot, and I, I met his dad. At, he's one of at one of my accounts. He owned the business, and we we talked about the F one seventeen. I had put pictures of it. I even had a copy of my book that I signed and gave him. And uh, he, he lost spatial awareness. He was flying, you know, with the IRAD, and the airplane had banked, and he wasn't aware of it. Oh, and, damn! Yeah, right into a mountain. It was instant. Um, but a friend of mine, Pete, uh, Pete Merlin, uh, that was me. Uh, uh, we call him the Wizard. Pete, yeah, Pete, yeah, Pete Merlin. Hey, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She's guarding her bowl of food. Yeah, it's her food. Uh, it's my dogs. He's a an aeronautical archaeologist. He, he go find crash sites. Cool. And when I first met Pete, I figured, wow, well, that's. It's a pretty hokey, yeah, it's a pretty hokey. Now, you're an aeronautical ar- archaeologist. 
he goes to crash sites and he'll pick up the pieces of air, classified airplanes that have crashed and he'll identify where these parts are by the part number and he has the you know the page out of the TO that shows that part and it, it was I spent a couple hours with him at his, his parents house uh, up in the Hollywood Hills when I first met him and he does an incredible job yeah um, yeah, he's you know, he's also one of the interceptors too. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and he goes he goes out to crash sites and tries to identify stuff that, uh, uh, I, like the one that crashed, uh, the one that the first Blackbird to crash, which was Ken Collins. It crashed near south of Wendover, Utah, and Pete had photos of the crash site, and he he knew about where it went and he matched the topography and he has a picture that he took of from the same angle with the same size lens today of you know years after the crash yeah. and the one of the crash and you superimpose them I and mean, i mean it's the hills and everything also identical so he knew it was the right spot so he was there with a metal detector and he and he he gave me pieces and parts of uh number 123 which wow. is the third a12 that's cool now, that's awesome about five years ago when i when i first moved from hawaii back to the mainland it had been more than, it's been more than five years but something crashed near glenwood uh, new mexico and when it hit the ground it was traveling three thousand miles an hour holy cow and they put a tfr a temporary flight restriction 30 miles around this lo lo specific longitude and latitude. And this is before I had my Corvette, and I drove my, uh, I, I decided I was going to go investigate. And I went into Glenwood, and they were having, it was, it was uh, Veterans Day. And they were having a big thing at the Legion Hall. So I went in, and I'm a veteran, so I showed my little blue card. Yeah. And, and uh, I met the, uh, it was the fire chief. And I said, hey, I got a question. He said, a couple months ago, you know, you had a something crashed out here in the desert. I mean, out here in the the, the wilderness, because the, the whole area is a, a wilderness area, mm -hmm. wilderness uh, camps camping area. He said, yeah. I said there were there were trucks and trucks with bulldozers in the back and cranes and stuff like that. Well, they were they were in they went in you know they went west you know into the into the, the mountains down this one particular road. Uh, they were in there for a day or two and came out. Uh, they say there's like half a dozen white vans filled with guys, oh. a flatbed with big tarp over it. It wasn't <laughs> a very big pile, but uh, yeah. something crashed there. And I thought I knew the road, the dirt road they, they went down. So I went down six miles down this dirt road, and I, I have my GPS on my phone, and it's, I'm, right, I'm right at the center of the, of the temporary flight restriction. Which was which was supposed to last for thirty days. It was gone within about a week, but there's no record of a TFR a, T a TFR ever being filed. Wow! So, hmm. but it was clocked. It was clocked at, at the, uh, the 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 center at Albuquerque at three thousand miles an hour. Three thousand miles an hour. So is that Holy so shit. in the desert and in that type of area? Wounds do not heal, but it takes it takes forever, especially in the desert. Pershing's tank tracks are still out in the Mojave Desert near, near uh, uh, Twenty Nine Palms in that area well, when, he, mm -hmm. when he were practicing tank warfare for World War One. Yeah, you can still see him from from space. Wow, that's yeah. pretty nuts. So when when you do something in desert, when you do something in desert, the scar stays there for a lifetime. Yeah. That's why that you know that's why they 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 protect you know they protect our, the desert some lot of areas because you start going in there with a with a a dirt bike or a four wheeler and tear up and it it doesn't heal yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like it's not like uh, you know you can go into a field that you know this year we had wheat next year we're gonna have cotton or something like that yep, that's yeah that's totally different yeah. yeah man so so are we uh, um, <laughs> this one's over here. <laughs> You got your little clicker there. Uh, so, uh, I mean, when I hear 3,000 miles per hour, that, I mean, that sounds very fast. Um, do we know that it was a, a craft of ours or? 
it's it, it's a it's an unknown. Yeah. Um, when the when the the convoy left, it headed it headed towards Silver City, and that's all that's all they told me. So they could have uh, uh, they could have been you know heading to Holloman. Um, could have been headed you know they could have gone to Socorro, uh, but they headed south. Yeah. And what's what is south is you know you know in that part of New Mexico. You got to, you, you, they were going the wrong direction to you know to go to the wrong part of the state to go to Holloman hmm. or to White Sands. Okay. So for all I know, they were heading to Area Fifty One. I don't know. Yeah. But, right. Th- but they were there. So I went and my, with my car. I went down six six and a half miles to right where the center of the TFR was, and it's a uh, it's a camping area. Hmm. So, so, huh. so I turned around. I didn't I didn't have I didn't have water with me. I didn't have pr- provisions. And it was just a day trip, so right. three hundred mile each way. But oh, uh, geez. Uh, I went home knowing that that may be the road, but I didn't go down far enough. Right. So it wasn't until a year later that Stu Brown he used to be with Popular Science and then with Fortune. Um, we took his car because I didn't want to damage my car, <laughs> and we drove down twenty one miles down this road. Damn. Now they had they had a semi with a flatbed on it. There were there were corner there were turns that we went around that it was impossible no no truck could make it unless you had a crane to lift yeah. it up and out over the sky and move it. If they would have bulldozed to the crash site, there's a road. There's going to be there's going to be there's going to be a scar. Yeah, and we just this COVID crap put us you know put a uh, oh, crimp in that. Damn. Yeah, um, and now the heat. I think the world's coming to an end. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I've never thought about that. Like when there are, because we all know that you know the people that are into this, you know this this topic know that there are crash retrievals that happen a lot. And I never think about, yeah, you have to get those flatbeds out of these wilderness areas. So you either have to make the road or just use the ones that are there. And if and if. I don't know how convenient it would be for the thing to crash next to the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right. there has there has to be an impact area. There has to be scarring where they drove the, the flatbeds and the and the tractors, right. and the bulldozers off the road right. to go to the crash site. Even if they try to uh, restore it, it's going to be it's the the, the soil and the, and the the plants and everything else is going to be totally it's different than everything around it. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be it would be a maybe a bright green scar uh, because the because the the the, fly, the the plants and, and shrubs and stuff are you know, maybe new. came out of a nursery or newer or whatever. Yeah. Um, oh, maybe there's like a landscaper that goes out there and like replants yeah, plants. That's, that's what you do, you dude. sneaky bastards. Dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, need get, you need to get a government yeah. contract, dude. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Crash the retrieval. If you're listening, <laughs> no. landscaping. And, and the question is, what was it? Uh, we don't know. Uh, every time we try to put together a. a expedition something has happened yeah um yeah steve steve douglas is a is a dear friend and he's uh he has sort of a rolling nsa uh, he's a ham radio operator and, and he's an intercept electronic interceptor he has he has a control room in his house and uh-huh. he has monitors going all the time he has special antennas for picking up things maybe he shouldn't pick them up because they go in they, <laughs> yeah. they go in they bounce frequencies around and he's figured out how to unbounce it i don't know if i got you in trouble steve i'm sorry <laughs> uh, hey we're uh, still a small podcast man yeah. I, no one's listening yeah but, <laughs> no one important um, at least but he's you know but he's he, he's a he's one of the interceptors too and he's uh he's he's heard reports of stuff and uh, going fast i had I've been doing this forever. Before a lot of you out there were ever born, I would have been doing this. I do it because I enjoy it. Yeah. I like being I like being outside. I like yeah. being yeah, you know, I like the desert. I like to doing things I'm not supposed to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm good at it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh it's it's y- y- I'm a firm believer, and you, you have to you, know, you have to live the life 
uh, as it, as ex, as exciting as you can. Absolutely. Because you don't know if you're going to walk outside and get hit hit by a meteorite or you know, or there's going to be an earthquake or uh, you're going to have a you know, massive heart attack. Oh, you yeah. don't know. Car crash. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Every t- you know, every time I ever saw my saw my any of my children, my, my son or my daughter, my grandsons, I tell them I love them. Because I never, I didn't hear that from my dad when I was growing up. I did from my mom. She was Sicilian. That's all. I mean, yeah. Thank God for my Sicilian <laughs> mom. Yeah. Um, but my dad was born and raised in the infantry, and he, he wasn't allowed any emotion. So I went out of my way to tell my kids and, I, and my wives. I've had a couple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a real good one now. So uh, I don't know it's it's important. It's important that you you live. That's why. You know, I start. I started my road trip initially in the beginning of this COVID nineteen bullshit. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you can have that on the air or what you're having. Yeah, 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 you're fine. It does not matter. Yeah, um, yeah. I started in April, and yeah, but I was in Minneapolis when uh, 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 George Floyd got uh, taken out. Yeah, and I was there for all the the beginning of all the writing. I, I was with my son, and I said, "I'm getting out of Dodge. I'm not going to be around." So I drove yeah. nonstop from Minneapolis. To just north of Colorado Springs, thousand miles without stopping. Wow! Other than getting gas, I didn't want to be near any big city. Yeah, yep. I stayed in Albuquerque, an old town uh, where Stu lives, and then next day I was home. But um, I don't know. I, th- I you don't know when it's going to end. Yeah. And I've I have been blessed by having some very very wonderful friends in my life. Uh, I have. Uh, I've married a couple absolutely gorgeous women in my life. Um, I have the most fantastic, wonderful son a dad could ever want. Yeah. His name is James, like his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather. All right. And I have a beautiful daughter. She's taken on a task that uh, would probably nominate her for state, you know, for sainthood. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, she's, my, my daughters and her husband are t- have taken on adopting two autistic boys uh, they're Hmong they're aged five and six and those are two of the luckiest little boys in the whole wide world yeah definitely because yeah. my daughter would just as soon chew her arm off than fail yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah she's, she's that she's that focused yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and I've you know I've uh, again I've delighted to when I ran into you guys I, I I knew it was it was the right thing to do I believe in fate we you know we we came together because we were supposed to. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Man. I I came down through Texas on my way home for a couple of reasons, but one of the reasons I really wanted to come and spend an evening with you guys. Heck yeah! And here I am. Yeah. I yes, mean, man. what better time to to do it? I mean, if you're already on a road trip, I mean, when when's the next time we're going to be able to well, hang why, why, out? I, 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 so. I asked Joe earlier when, when you headed out, you know, home to. You get the, the thing you forgot. Yeah, <laughs> I said when I told you I was going to come by and visit you. Do you really? Did you really think I was going to drive to Taylor, Texas, to visit you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I mean, yeah. It was just it's it's just nice that you were actually able to on your road trip. You know, like we're one of your last stops. So that's that's awesome that you were able to <laughs> actually come and make it out. We're glad that you were able to come out you know i mean it's uh we're you know we want to start going and meeting all these different people um and it's awesome that like one of the coolest people that we've met so far doing well, all this I, stuff i, you I, know. Pre- I appreciate the compliment yeah man. i was when I, when I went to the the phoenix function last year i had i had done absolutely nothing ufo related for 10 years i lived in hawaii for four uh-huh. And when I retired from the Pacific Aviation Museum there in Pearl Harbor, I retired, moved to moved to Tucson, and I spent six years working on books. My Blackbird book is one of them. Uh, and it, and I went to I went I went to the the you know, Congress or the conference, whatever it was, on a whim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. To meet my friend Michael Schrad, UFO Com, and uh, George Knapp. Yep. And Jeremy Corwell and. And that's when I ran into Doc Skinner, and I ran in. Yeah, I ran into Lauren Felton, and that's when uh, uh, 
Robert uh, Dolan from chasing after me after I left my car. Jim, Jim, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I, no one knew who I was. I am. Yeah. And he said, you went on, you went on the menu. You went on the program. <laughs> Shit, I didn't know I was gonna be here until this morning. Yeah, so I did, yeah. I'm going to Phoenix this morning. If Richard Dolan's chasing after you, you're doing something uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, and, and and I don't under I, I don't I I appreciate the the notoriety. I don't understand how I became anything other than a friend of Bob Lazar. Right. But I have spent a lot of time in the desert, and I, and I am really good at snooping, and I do my very, very best to pull out as much information from people as I can yeah. Yeah, man. Without, without violating their trust. Right. right. I, I think if you knew how big of a deal you were, it, I, it wouldn't be as special. I think it's the, your humbleness that makes it more awesome. I am nobody special. <laughs> I'm a guy who loves airplanes. Mm-hmm. I'm a guy who likes technology. I'm a guy who likes things that go bump in the night. And it's my job as American taxpayer to ask questions of my government. Yep. And I'm really good at it. I'm not intimid- intimidated by them. When I, when I had my go around with my Pentagon pass, I never got into that, that part of it. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, as I was saying, they, I'll start from refresh the, the crew. I had, my, I had a flag on my, my uh, security clearance because I was under an investigation for something. And my wing commander had not been advised of it, which is required by Air Force regulations that the commanding officer be apprised within 24 hours of someone under their command being under investigation for mm. a security violation. And the security violation was the very first book on the F-117, which apparently oh. had things that were still classified top secret in it. Oh, yeah. But I had this meeting with Pete Ames and another agent, and I know it was filmed and, and uh, recorded. And he's telling me, he said, that, you know, I don't like the questions you're asking. I said, it's my job as a taxpayer to, to ask questions of my government, and it's your job as an employee of we the people to answer those questions honestly. And as we're going round and round, and we you know, finally uh, uh, we're getting to the getting to the end, and I said, "Pete, are we done?" He said, "Yes." And I stand up, and he's kind of a short guy. And I looked at him, down on him. I said, "Pete, you know what really pisses you off about me?" So what's that? He said, "I'm not afraid of you." And I go, <laughs> and I gave him the raspberry. He went. I mean, you could just see him, <laughs> the rage. And I have a buddy of mine who worked at the Joint Chiefs. He said he heard that Pete was ordered to go home by the medics <laughs> about 15 minutes after I left because they couldn't get his blood pressure under control. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. I think that's another, like, really awesome message. I mean, not only just in this podcast, but I, this specific episode, but I think one of the things that you stand for that's awesome, and I hope people take this to heart, is, like, just the government isn't that... You know, I mean, they can just they can destroy you in a they, in a pen stroke yeah. if they wanted to. But if you know your rights, uh, you can. <laughs> am, I, am, I, I, am I saying too much, or is, no, no, uh, no. is that wrong? <laughs> I, I have I have never drawn inside the lines. I have never played inside the box. Right. That's, I've never in my life. Um, and when I was seven, my best friend's dad was base commander at Moffett Field Naval Air Station, Moffett Field in Mountain View, California, home of NASA Ames. It was NACA back then. Mm. And my, my best friend was named Danny, and his dad was, was commander. And we were always referred to Captain Smith's son and that friend of his, <laughs> I being the, that friend of that his. Friend. And anyway, I'd, I'd set pins at the bowling alley, and we, and we really had the run of the base. Everybody knew us. We are like Batman and Robin type. <laughs> and I came over to the base one day, it was during the summer, and, he, and Danny says, there's the coolest airplane I've ever seen in the big hangar, Hangar 1. So let's go take a look at it. So we're riding our bikes, we'd ride right to our bikes right down the, the, the hangar, you know, they're tech, you know, bringing airplanes in and out, yeah. and far end, closest to the bay, is a, an area has curtains blocking off the area. It says, keep out. We're seven years old. We can read, but yeah, it doesn't compre- comprehend, you know, comprendo. So we moved the curtains back, and here is the XF-104 Starfighter from the Skunk Works. 
the very first F-104. It had been in the... In the I want to pull up a photo of it. What yeah, is it called? Yeah, the, the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. It was a missile with a man in it. It had seven-foot wings. It had a J-79. It, wow. It go Mach 2.2. Wow. It's beautiful. It looks like a stiletto. It's a beautiful-looking airplane. So, I, I found an F-104 Starfighter for sale. Yeah. <laughs> see. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So here, here's the prototype. It's still classified secret, because I know that, because I just finished the history on it. <laughs> and Danny said, get in the cockpit, because the canopy was open. Oh, that's <laughs> so, I, so I don't know if he, I don't know if he opened the canopy or it was open, but I got in the cockpit and closed the canopy, and I'm sitting there just... This is really cool. Then I realized I'm in an ejection seat. <laughs> no. <laughs> not knowing that you're not going to have an arm ejection seat when it's in a wind tunnel or it's in a hangar right. and it's a prototype or whatever. And it, and it was also a downward ejection seat. So uh, I'm going to get out. So I, Danny opened the canopy and he couldn't unlock it oh no uh -oh. the thing is jammed so uh -oh. you had to call shore patrol <laughs> and the marines to come and take me out of and that was and that's really where my passion for lockheed airplanes started <laughs> yeah that's great that's awesome. that's yeah. so great getting stuck in a in a secret airplane that yeah you're not supposed to be when, in. <laughs> when you're when you're, se when you're seven years old that's yeah. amazing. oh man yeah. that is some so foreshadowing great. for like, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah definitely yeah, definitely yeah. Shit, what, man. What, you, you have, what else? I mean, uh, that's that's pretty you, good. I, yeah. th I think you're. I think the way that we kind of Tarantino this, where mm. your origin story came at the very end, mm. and how it brings in your passion for all of this stuff. I think that's a perfect place to end. Yeah, this that been, sounds uh, good. I, yeah, I am. Yeah. I am delighted to see you two again. Yes. I, I want to see it another Likewise. UFO conference. And, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, who knows? We may have been visited by then. Yep, <laughs> yep. We might, we might have been, and uh, we'll have to come in. Uh, we'll have to come and visit you out in Arizona. Yeah, I would be, I would be tickled. Yeah, I that'd be, be great, tickled. man. I have oh, a guest great. room. And I don't know if the two of you can. You know, we also have a hide a bed in the in the office. So cool, man. Yeah, we'll figure cool. it out. I've slept on many of floors in my yeah. day. So <laughs> and I have a pool and I have a hot tub. Awesome, oh, awesome. Damn, and when nice. you when if you guys come out, I. I I intend to have a German Shepherd rescue dog by then. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Man. Yeah. That sounds great. That yeah. sounds great. Well, yeah, dude. I think that's going to be yeah, it for me. Yeah, man. Th thank you so much again, man. That, that, was, that was awesome. It was kicking but, the uh, butt. Man. I, yes, sir. I, I am absolutely delighted to do it in person. Yeah, yes, sir. That that's makes so it even awesome. more fun. I know. I know. I'm so <laughs> glad we got to do this. Thank yeah. you again for the book yeah. and the patch and everything. And uh, yeah, man. That's it for me. It's ever me, dude. All right, dude. Well, um, this was another episode of UFO Garage. Peace. Peace.